The Right Choice Standing with his face pointed towards the new sun, Audley captured the moment to his memory. Thinking of it, this whole day would remain in the hidden world of his mind forever. Today he, Audley the shoemaker, was to obtain the key to his very own store. How many days, weeks, months, years had he imagined this moment, when he had lain quivering in the corner of his master's store, dreading the beating that was soon to come, being undeservedly punished. He had watched his dear little brother die at the hands of the enraged master. Through this all, he had survived with the thought that one day he would own his own little store with a wooden sign hanging just above the doorframe, telling the whole town that if they wanted new or replaced shoes, all they need do was to step over the wooden threshold and he would be there to serve them. And on the dark nights, when his master's beatings had lasted so long and were of such vicious force that he was certain that he would never again see the sun slip over the distant hills, he had vowed that no boy working for him would undergo such harsh treatment. And now, as he stood on the threshold to a new life, his heart overflowing with joy and excitement for the new world that lay in front of him, his mind racing on what to do first, his hands trembling with the brass keys, allowing him to enter the life he had so long desired. Finally taking a hungry gulp of fresh morning air, he slowly pushed the keys into the lock, and with a confident twist, the old wooden door swung open, allowing the sunlight to fill what would otherwise be a dingy room. Inhaling another mouthful of the delicious air, Audley stepped into his new life. First thing that he had to do was employ a journeyman and find a much-needed apprentice. With confident strides of success, he made his way out of the shop and down the street. His mind racing before his long strides, he was thinking of his dear friend's younger brother who was without a master at present, as his late master, also a shoemaker, had died of the plague recently, leaving the poor boy without employment or a fulfilled trade. Audley's long, strong legs made short work of the distance to his friend's house, and within minutes his sun-darkened hand was upon the decaying door. Upon his entry into the mud home, Audley had to stand still for a few moments, letting his eyes adjust to the dim interior of the little home in which his friend had lived all his life. As his eyes slowly began to make out the basic wood furniture, he spotted his lifelong friend standing with his back to him while he gathered his stew bowl and spoon. Suddenly turning, he spotted Audley in the doorway. Audley, what brings you out in the middle of a work day? He boomed and started across the small piece of floor that separated them. And a good day to you, my friend, Audley said in a sarcastic tone as he reached out to pound the other on the back. With a large white-toothed grin, that had caused many a maiden to fumble. The friend began to make apologies in his most proper voice. Oh, I do beg your pardon, sir, but your sudden appearance somewhat startled me. There is no excuse for my terrible lack of manners, but I do beg your pardon. Please, kind sir, excuse my acts. He then proceeded to drop to his knees and cling to Audley's legs and imitated heartbreaking sobs for forgiveness. Amidst fits of laughter, Audley managed to choke out. Get up, you fool. I came here on business, not for games. Besides, I have to get back to my store soon. With this, the fellow on the floor instantly claimed his composure and leapt up with an exclamation of delight. Oh my! I completely forgot that today you claimed your long-awaited store. Congratulations, my friend. Audley thought that his arm would be shaken off with the rigorous handshake that he received. This sent him into another fit of laughter. Stop, he gurgled. I need to talk to you about your brother. Now the other man's expression grew serious. Why, has something happened to little Tim? His anxiety showing in his large brown eyes. Don't look so worried, William. I merely wanted to ask if Tim has found another master yet. For if he has not, then I would very much like to ask him if he would come and be my apprentice. All traces of concern had vanished from William's face. In its place crept utter joy and excitement. He tried to form a sentence, but just managed a confusion of words all jumbled together. Timmy! Oh, work for you! Oh, I... you... Timmy! You are... oh, just... just... wonderful! As hard as he tried, 
Audley could not restrain from bursting into yet another fit of laughter at his friend's stumbling thanks. Thumping his dear friend on the back again, he joyously said, Now, now, William, don't even start on that foolish thanking attempt. Your little brother has been almost like my own, and I would consider it a privilege to have him working under me. Besides, I consider it my duty to look after him and make sure that he does not get placed under a cruel, uncaring master. After what happened to my own little brother, his eyes filled with tears that he hastily dismissed as he finished patiently. I will not let that happen to Tim. And so the matter was settled. Audley returned to his store with little Tim's hand set firmly in his own. The next day dawned bright and clear, and so did Audley's spirits, for the day before he had started Tim on the schedule and had managed to secure the assistance of a journeyman, who would work three days for him and then the remaining days at his present master's store. This plan was not ideal, but would have to suffice, until Audley was more settled in his new store. As Audley walked out into the street before his house, his thoughts travelled back to the night his beloved father had died. It was the week before he had entered his sixth year of life, and he had immediately started his apprenticeship at the cruel master Alfred's store. He had stood trembling beside his dying father's bed, desperate to hear what his parting words of comfort and hope for the future would be. His father had lifted a shaking hand towards Audley, smoothed his damp cheek, and said in a feeble, gasping voice, My son, you brought such joy and peace into our home. You were born in a time of prosperity and good fortune, hence your name, Audley. You know it means prospering, don't you? He had replied by giving a solemn nod of his young head. His father had seemed glad with his son's awareness of his name. Even at his young age, and with this confirmed, the dying father seemed more at peace and able to go on sharing his last words on this earth. Now, at the time of your birth, I owned many stores and many different kingdoms. This is how we had acquired our wealth and were prospering. Then, with your birth, our joy reached its fill and began to overflow. We were so happy to have a son as our firstborn. We showered you with gifts, hired the best maid in the kingdom, and tended you and paraded you around the town and marketplace. But when you were a mere three months old, the king made a decree that merchants were not permitted to open stores in the surrounding kingdoms. The stores in the neighboring kingdoms would immediately be claimed and given to their own citizens. Hence, we lost everything. Our manor, our servants, our grounds, our animals, even our clothes and personal items. This was a terrible shock to your mother and myself. All we had left was the one store in town, which, as fate would have it, happened to be the smallest store I owned. So we moved into this small mud house, and your mother had to start doing her own housework, grooming and cooking, all of which she had never been trained in. She did not know what to do. You lost your maid, rich gifts and opportunity to be a squire for some royal family instead of a poor apprentice being beaten under his master's whip. As for me, I went back to working and running my own store, which I did not have to do since my first years as master of a store. So now, my precious boy, you know all our sad family history. Now I must leave you and go to that other world where there is no pain, work, suffering, and no controlling king that will take away everything you have worked so hard to get. Again, the dying man laid his hard, blistered hand against the boy's soft cheek, and his eyes scanned the thin face lovingly. Then suddenly, a bright, desperate light had beamed out of them. Grasping his son's hand with an amazing strength, he said in a passionate voice, Listen to me. You must promise me, before I die, that you will not spend the rest of your life living in this way. Work hard and apply yourself. Make your way up, up to the top where we once were. But don't let anyone take it away from you. No one. Promise me. Promise me now, quickly, before I am taken away from you. With tears cascading down his face, 
the youth had grasped his father's hand and with a passion far exceeding his years had promised, I swear, father, that I will do what you would have liked to see me do. I will bring back our wealth and fulfill my name's meaning. And with that, his father had died with peace in his eyes. And now, twelve years later, he stood outside his very own store. He felt that at last he had begun to fulfill his promise to his dying father. There was much work to do still, but he sensed that he had begun the journey. His eyes surveyed the street, spying young Tim skipping in joyous glee to begin a new day at the workbench. Audley smiled at the sight, wishing that he too had had such a carefree look during his apprenticeship. But that was in the past now. He must look to the future with its trials and troubles, joys and worries, surprises and sorrows. But through all this, he must do what he had promised his father. He must succeed. A small hand tugged on his tunic. Looking down, he met the dark, innocent eyes of his young charge. A smile tickled along his dark, attractive face as his powerful arm swept down to retrieve the little treasure at his feet. Tossing him in the air, he listened with joy to the squeals of delight exuding from the small child. Settling him into a seated position in his arms, he questioned the boy with playful seriousness. So, my little man, what is it that you wanted of me that you persisted in the tugging of my very new tunic? He forced his brow into a playful frown. The child, whose eyes were well trained for his Uncle Ord's games, burst forth into a fresh eruption of giggles. Oh, Uncle Ord, the child merrily giggled. You are so funny. That tunic is older than me. He giggled again then, setting his small face for the business at hand, he questioned. When shall we start work? And where am I to put my lunch that brother sent with me? Two very good questions indeed. Ones that needed immediate attention. Squaring his broad shoulders, Audley addressed them in order. Well, my young sir, we shall begin work when the sun begins its work of shining over the land and we will end our work when the sun retires for the day. As to the placement of your lunch, I think that we had better venture inside and investigate as to the very best spot you could place it in. Swinging the child to the ground, he offered his hand and the two made their way into the store. The weeks that followed were filled with the flurry of setting up a new shop. There were counters to make, work benches to construct, store furniture to design, and, of course, Lots of cleaning to attend to, for the store had stood abandoned for over three years, so the dust and decay was vast. But with the diligent help of his young apprentice, Audley was able to make quick work of the chaos, and within two weeks he pushed open his newly hung door and welcomed the public inside. His business grew as word quickly spread throughout the small village that the new shoemaker was a stupendous craftsman. His work could not be faulted, and he was honest and prompt with his orders. Soon, travellers from the neighbouring villages began to visit Audley's shop to purchase his amazing shoes and to bring him their old worn shoes that other cobblers could not repair. Audley welcomed all into his humble store and received each order or request with a cheerful smile and pleasant words. He took great joy in being able to help others, and when his craft was praised he would meekly smile and try harder to make the next order even better. His fame spread even to the ears of the young princess in the Grand Palace. And one fine spring day, three months after swinging his door open, a young messenger that was dressed in the palace's finery stepped over his threshold. Audley immediately rose from his workbench and, wiping his grubby hands on a rag, went to assist the messenger at the counter. His merry voice rippled around the clean room, filling it with the warmth and sparkle that caused many to return to the humble building. Well, good day, sir. What may I do for you on this most beautiful of spring days? The messenger seemed uncomfortable to be in the lower parts of the region, as he shuffled his weight from one foot to the other. A high-pitched voice followed the soothing one after a few moments. I have come here on an order from the princess to request you to create an absolutely original pair of slippers for the young princess to wear to her father's dance in a few days. I have brought a pair of her older slippers for you to make a match in size, and here is a scrap of the fabric her dress is to be made in, 
The slippers need to match the dress perfectly and they must be unlike any other slippers ever created. Do you understand? If these slippers do not meet with the princess's liking, your little store could be shut down. Now, I will be back in three days to collect them, and they had better be acceptable. With that, the puckish-looking messenger dropped a silk-covered box onto the counter. Swishing his cape around his plump shoulders, he strode boldly towards the door, obviously eager to be free of the village sounds and smells. Audley stood behind his large wooden counter. Shock washed over his whitened face. His store being shut down? That could not be. Not after all he had endured to attain it. No, he would not let that happen. He would make the very best pair of slippers the princess had ever seen. She would not be able to dislike them. He would make sure of it. Stretching his hard-working hands out, he wrapped them gently around the soft box. With careful movements, he drew the pin out of the lock and lifted the lid. There, inside, were the prettiest slippers he had ever seen. They were of a milky white velvet. A laced ribbon threaded its way through the edge of the slipper. Shimmering beads travelled together to make patterns of flowers and dewdrops upon the alluring fabric. His eyes indulged for many moments in the study of these amazing little slippers. Once his appetite was satisfied by the examination of the artwork in his hands, his mind was able to focus on the task before him. Creating a masterpiece that would surpass even this one. Shock once more cascaded through his system. He had never made a pair of finely laced slippers before, let alone a pair that related to this level of perfection. How would he even begin with this daunting task? Where would he receive his inspiration? Where would he get the supplies to create these slippers that would adorn the tiny feet of a princess? In his despair, he cast his eyes down, and there, pooling at the bottom of the silk box, was exactly what he needed to begin this project the scrap of fabric the messenger had spoken of. Letting his finger indulge in the sweet coolness of the silken fabric, he raised it out of its rested position. Holding it up before himself, he measured it out. His heart leapt at the discovery. It would be enough for him to make two little slippers out of. He would even have a bit left over if his measurement was correct. Re-inspired by this discovery, he turned to scan his eyes through the store in search of his young ward. A squeal from outside distracted him, and his head immediately swung in the direction of the note. There, twirling under the new budding leaves, was the young boy his eyes had sought moments before. The child's arms were outstretched, his rounded face cast back and his thin legs propelling the small body into a spin. His peals of laughter floated softly on the cool breeze. His complete contentment at the ability to be in the new birth of a season vibrated off his young face. The older eyes that watched the twirling boy suddenly took on a new light. He had his inspiration for the daunting task. He would present the princess with slippers of spring and make her feet dance in the contented way that the young boy outside was enjoying. With determined eagerness he set to work. The tap of a cobbler's hammer could be heard late into the night. The lamps in the shoemaker's store burning long after the others in the village had been snuffed. Three days he worked, day and night, creating his masterpiece. His young assistant eagerly offered his hands whenever the master required them, his dark eyes watching in amazement as the small slippers began to take form. He watched with even more fascination as his employer forged on, driving past exhaustion and fatigue, denying the taste of food and refusing the arms of sleep's sweet embrace. He had a mission and nothing would stand in his way. The child's eyes, wide with wonder, watched as his employer disregarded all in his quest for the perfect slippers. The third day finally dawned, bright and clear. Spring's sweet scents played in the air. New birds chirped in thankfulness to life. Brightly adorned petals stretched out in a grand display of beauty. The reddened eyes of Audley saw none of this, however, for they were set on the dusty street outside the store. His ears were strained in the search of the sound belonging to the messenger's horses. With anxious hands he laid the slippers into the silken box that had once belonged to another pair. Before he let them come to rest at the bottom of the box, he examined them one last time. 
his weakened fingers traced the soft silk that was of a dark purple. His hand had laced the edges of the hole in which the princess's feet would slip, with an emerald green braid that had been twirled with a golden thread. He had gone in search of the most beautiful of blossoms and had pressed them between heavy leather overnight. Then, with glistening threads and beads, he had secured them to the slippers, their delicate petals having been secured with the most precise miniature stitches. Small, freshly pressed leaves traced the circumference of the slippers, with glistening beads and fine embroidery weaving its way between the leaves. Finally, hanging from the braid at the top of the slippers, they were the most perfect little flowers hanging from a golden thread. They gathered in clusters and danced across the slippers when they were moved. These flowers, upon closer inspection, were discovered to be constructed from the same fabric as the slippers themselves, sewn together in such an excellent manner that, unless you stooped down to examine them closely, you would be convinced that they were that of the great nature itself. He let the slippery fabric slide out of his hand and go to rest at the base of the box. He raised the lid and with trembling hands secured it atop the box. Slipping the pin back into place, he let himself sink down onto the stool. Closing his eyes, he began to wait again for the sound of horses' hooves upon the sandy ground. Moments later, he felt a hard hand upon himself. His body was being shaken vigorously by impatient hands. A voice filled with irritation bombarded his senses, forcing his stinging eyes to open. He met with the red face of the messenger as his squeaky voice grated his tired ears. Come, man, waken from your rest. I have got to be on my way and you need to give me what I came for. Come, wake up so I can be going. With each word the shaking increased and so did the messenger's frustration. Making his eyes grow larger, he raised his head from the counter and made an attempt to stand. Confusion, generated from his interrupted sleep, had covered his mouth as a large yawn escaped. The messenger's voice pierced his senses as he again asked for it. His mind still in a fog of sleep, the shoemaker questioned around yet another yawn. What is it you are referring to, sir? The red-faced man's voice almost pierced the walls as he shouted. The princess's slippers! Give them to me at once! Recollection flooded his mind, washing away all traces of sleep. The messenger was here. He had been sleeping. Rushing to the workbench, he collected the silk box and quickly thrust it into the messenger's hands. With the placement of the box, he said, Here you are, sir. I am most dreadfully sorry about the fact that you found me sleeping. I have not had much sleep the last few days as a result of my desire to complete this order before you returned. I do hope the princess will be pleased with it. Oh, here is the old pair you sent. Handing the second pair of slippers to the messenger, he forced his stiff, tired lips into a smile. His attempt seemed pointless, for once the man had re-secured the second pair of shoes, he turned abruptly away and stomped out of the door. Audley watched as the galloping horses drifted out of sight. It was done. He had made them. Now all that was left to do was wait. Wait to hear what the young princess thought. His fate was in her hands. Her like or dislike of the slippers would determine whether or not his store would stay open. These thoughts rushed through his tired brain as his eyes began to slip closed. Realizing that fatigue was now a pressing force against him, he forced his legs to take him towards the back of the store, where a freshly made bed was waiting. He collapsed onto the bed and allowed sleep to invade his exhausted body. The days following the collection of the slippers dragged by painfully for Audley. He could not concentrate on his work, his appetite all but disappeared, and the sparkle that normally glistened from his eyes had died. The prospect of his store being taken from him was at the forefront of his mind. He relived those dreadful moments under the vicious hands of his master, the cries of his brother's voice as he was taken from him, the look in his father's eyes as he had urged his eldest son to return their family name to virtue and honour once again. The strain of these thoughts and the pain that they carried with them seemed to almost destroy the young man. His obvious torment disturbed the young apprentice greatly, and he did all in his power to relieve the suffering man a little, all to no avail. Finally, in complete despair, the young child asked if he may be given a few hours leave after work. 
His employer granted his request, and as the sun sank down below the distant mounts, he rushed from the store. His little feet pounding the sandy ground as he rushed past stores and mud houses, reaching the one he desired above all. He set his teeny hands to the hard door. Gaining entry, he rushed to the lanky figure in the shadows, his voice carrying the alarm his heart felt. He tugged at his brother's hand. William, you have to come with me right now. Audley has gone almost mad. I don't know what else to do. Please say you will come. The pleading tones needed to beg not a moment longer, for his brother had seized his hand and was dragging him out of the door before he had finished speaking. The brothers made their way hastily back to the shoemaker's shop. On the way, William demanded the little boy tell him all that had transpired. Once they reached the dark door, he understood the entire situation. Kneeling so as to be able to look into the child's eyes, he said softly, Timmy, I wish to speak with Audley alone. Could you go to the neighbours for a while while I talk with him? The little head nodded. He would be glad to have a time to visit with his friend in the house adjoining the shoemaker's. Seeing the child safely rush into the opposite door, William stood and entered the shop of his dear friend. His voice vibrated off the mud walls as he called out, Audley? Where are you? Tim came and called me. He said you were not well. Ouch! His voice stopped as his leg bumped into the workbench. Rubbing his insulted knee, he called out again. Come now, man. Where are you? I can't see a thing. A movement in the corner of the room caused him to slowly make his way in that direction. Feeling something soft with the tip of his shoe, he dropped down and in blind fumbling he found his friend huddled in a tight ball in the corner. Audley! What can I do to help you, friend? Tim told me the whole story. Poor fellow, you must not punish yourself over this. You are too strong and have gone through too much to let it get you down now. He laid his hand on the cowering figure's arm shocked to find how thin and weak it was. He continued in a comforting voice, yet one that would not be refused. Come, let's get some light in here and then see to finding you something to eat. He gently raised the shadow of a man up and guided him over to the workbench. Settling him down, he went in search of some lint and a lamp. Striking the lint, the room instantly took on a glow of light. Returning to the table, he placed the lamp in the centre. After collecting a plate of food that Tim must have prepared earlier, he sat himself down opposite his friend and waited patiently for him to speak. Audley slowly chewed on the piece of cold meat. Swallowing hard, he gradually brought his eyes up to meet with those of his friend's concerned ones. His body ached from lack of sleep and food. His eyes felt dry and scratchy. His brain had finally gone numb. The sight of his friend created feeling to return to his head. He wished it would go away. He wished it would all go away. Life was too hard to keep on living. There were too many responsibilities, too many demands that you could never reach, too many feelings. Death would at least offer relief from it all. His head dropped against his chest as he squeezed his eyes shut, trying to squeeze the returning memories away. His friend's voice interrupted his efforts. Audley, you can't go on like this. You can't sink into a place that one will never be able to reach you again. I know it's hard. I know you don't want to go on. But you have to make a choice now. You either let yourself go and wait for death to come in, for that is where you are heading at the moment, or you can get up from this place. You can leave all the trials of your past just there, in the past, and you can make a difference for others so that they don't have to go through what you did. A hand came to rest on the slouching shoulders, as the soothing voice continued in an even softer tone. Just look at what you have done for Tim. You very well may have just saved his life, for you know that unless you had come into my house that day and offered him this job, he would have had to go to Master Roll, and you know how he treats his apprentices. Tim's small frame would not have been able to withstand Roll's cruelty for very long and he would have probably been with your brother by the end of the year. So you see, Audley, your horrific experience of your youth can save others now in your adulthood. You just have to make the decision to let them work for you, instead of against you. Come, friend, make the choice. 
He squeezed Audley's bony shoulders. The grieving man succumbed to his emotions and let his body vibrate with sobs that had been suppressed for over fifteen years. His friend's strong arms held him close, till at last the tortured body began to relax, and in a hoarse whisper, Audley choked out, Thank you, William. I think that you have just saved my life. After inhaling a few deep breaths, his voice was heard once more. I feel sleep approaching at last. Could you help me to my bed, dear friend? No answer was needed as William's powerful arms reached out and assisted Audley to his feet. Casting an arm around his weakened waist, he slowly led the exhausted man to his bed. Sun rays glittered through the doorway that led to the small bedroom. Audley raised himself onto one elbow. Rubbing his face with grubby hands, he examined the fall of sunshine upon the mud floor. The patterns weren't normally that long when he awoke in the morning. Come to think of it, he did not normally see the rays at all in the morning, for the sun rose behind the house, thus preventing its shafts of warmth to enter the shop till much later in the day. How could it now be that the sun had found its way into the room in the morning hours? As his confused mind turned these thoughts over, a familiar step was heard approaching the room, and within seconds his friend's cheerful face emerged from the opening. You're awake, finally! I was beginning to think that you would sleep the whole day away. How are you feeling? William approached the bed, collecting on his way a bowl of broth and a chunk of bread. Audley received them gratefully, for since his wakening he had been overwhelmed by a tremendous hunger. Sinking his teeth into the bread, he took a moment to enjoy the satisfying flavour of food again. Then he asked, What time is it? Clucking, William answered, Well, my friend, it is very late indeed. In fact, the sun is about to retire from its day's work. Shocked by the lateness of the hour, Audley tried to lunge from the confines of the enjoyable bed, only to be stopped by his still chuckling friend. There is no need for you to get up now since you will just be returning to the spot in a few hours. Lay back now and let me tell you what happened today. The weakened body relaxed once more against the cool covers, as the other settled himself on the edge of the bed. Looking quite comfortable indeed, he began to relate the events of the day. Well, I did not think that it would be wise for me to leave you last night, all things considered, and so I spent the night on the workbench. Really, Ord, you should consider making that bench a little more comfortable. Anyhow, this morning, since you seemed so contented to sleep, I thought I would run the shop for you. Tim helped me, of course. In fact, I think he did more work than me, but we managed to muddle through. And when customers came in asking for you, we simply said that you were unavailable at the present. But if they would come back in a few days, they would be sure to find you. That was the same answer we gave to the plump little messenger that came in just a little while ago. Blood pumped vigorously through Audley's veins. The messenger had come at last, and his friend seemed more interested in a spot on his hand than in revealing the message the man had brought. Unable to endure his friend's procrastination a moment longer, he burst forth. Tell me! What was his message? Oh, don't make me wait a moment longer! Is my fate doomed, or is it set to prosper? The light that surged from his eyes, and the colour that had returned to his cheeks, gave his friend hope for a total recovery. William's laugh rippled around the room as he attempted to speak. If you'll be quiet, old fool, for a moment, I may have a chance to answer your current of questions. Now will you be still as I continue? He arched an attractive eyebrow that gave his question a feeling of mirth rather than earnest. The figure upon the bed agreed to the conditions. Feeling at leave to continue, William began once more. Tim and I were busy at the work table. He was showing me how he mends a nasty hole in the sole of a sandal, when in marches your dear messenger. His flat, puckish nose thrust high in the air, he squealed out a request to be seen the owner of this fine store. As I have told you already, we informed him that you were unavailable. He then proceeded to tell us how very busy he was and could not spend all his time travelling back and forth from the palace to this little shop. Seeing his obvious irritation, I offered to relay any message he may have for you. This suggestion did not seem to satisfy him completely, but, upon reflection, he reached deep into his cape and returned with this. 
handing Audley a large sheet of paper that had been fastened by the king's seal in deep red wax. William's voice continued. After the stout man had released his letter, he added that the princess had admired the slippers very much and that you could expect more orders from the palace in the future. With that, he swished on his heels and trotted out the door. Tim's excitement reached exploding point, and I had to send him out on an errand for fear of him waking you with the news. So there you are. You are now the palace's preferred shoemaker. Now isn't that fine? The gleaming eyes were his only answer as trembling hands broke the seal and eagerly read the few lines the letter contained. Dear Sir, I write to you to inform you of the great delight I have in your workmanship of my little slippers. I do believe them to be the prettiest pair I have ever happened to see. I wish to ask you to apply your skilled hands once more to other creations. I have sent word to my seamstresses to supply you with the fabrics of my new dresses, so that you can create masterpiece slippers to go with every one. My sisters have exhibited envy at my beautiful shoes and wish to have pairs of their own. Their slipper sizes will be sent at a later date with my messenger. You shall be paid handsomely for each pair you produce, as to their originality and good craftsmanship. With many thanks for my little creations, your princess. Secured at the base of the page were four radiant gold coins. Gliding his finger over the glistening treasures, his heart rejoiced. This payment was three times more than he was used to receiving. Bringing his eyes up to meet those of his friends, he quietly said, Thank you, my friend. Your counsel last night and kindness today have given me a future. I shall proceed in my life's walk, giving those who are forced into the childhood I had an opportunity in my store. I have made my choice, my friend. I chose that from this day on, I will let the experiences from my past assist my future, and hopefully the future of many poor boys. Last night, William, you did not only save me from succumbing to death's gnashing teeth, but you saved many boys that can now come and take refuge from their cruel masters in this store. Thank you, William, my friend. He reached out his hand, and the other clasped it strongly and gratefully. His friend had been saved. Years have passed since this tender scene in the back room of a shoemaker's shop. Audley's dark hair has taken on a silver tint. His smooth, youthful face was now lined with soft wrinkles. His sparkling azure eyes had begun to dim with his growing age. His creased hand now rested on a stout cane, giving him extra aid as he slowly walked along the pebbled road, his plush carriage a few paces away, ready to assist his feeble legs if the need arose. He settled his highly shone shoes firmly down as he turned to face the building in front of him. His eyes travelled to the wooden sign swaying gently in the breeze. Shoemen and Sons, Shoe Store and Safe House for Boys. A large grin eased its way over the wrinkled face. He had done it. He had fulfilled his promise to his father, although years ago. He had restored the name of Schumann to its rightful place, and he had completed the legacy his father had wished to leave him. There were Schumann and Sons stores all over the kingdom and the surrounding kingdoms. A burst of children's laughter caused him to drop his eyes once more to the store. A group of them lined the work tables. Their leather aprons held the same name as the sign outside. Their little hands worked quickly as they processed shoes and slippers of all colors, sizes, and designs. The gaggle of customers gathered at the counter were being attended to in a friendly fashion by an older boy. He was attempting to fit a lady's slipper onto the foot of a little boy. The child's laughter rippled once more out into the street as the young man scratched his head in play confusion. The old man's eyes took on their familiar sparkle as he watched the proceedings inside the store. Finally, he turned his feeble legs towards the carriage, his mind filled with a contented thought. With a smile lurking beneath the wrinkles, he stepped into the carriage and began to rock away. With each sway of the carriage, his mind repeated the same words over and over. You made the right choice. The End